Welcome to I Love to Tell a Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecke. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And welcome to another year of the Narrative Lectionary. This is September, uh, the podcast for September 10th, 2023. And we are suggesting uh, that folks might want to consider grouping the first four uh, sun, uh, weeks of the Narrative Lectionary together as a series the power of names or the power of naming or something like that uh, because names and naming play an important role in each of these stories um so there's so many there's so many things in these uh these uh, this text especially that are important so i'm going to start with one and then just we'll just kind of go around um okay. and that is that uh there is a really important element of the story that is about vocation that the the man is put uh, in the garden uh, in order to till and to keep the garden. And uh, th those words are, are really uh, important words. I don't know if till and to keep are exactly uh, the, the proper translations of the words, but um, they are um, to serve and to protect. Uh, and so they're, they're really um, powerful words, and they suggest that there is a vocation that humanity has a whole of 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 serving uh, serving the earth. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important point to make, especially in our age of climate change and and other uh, ways in which we realize we're having an effect on the earth uh, more than any other previous generation. So. Uh, I just want to add when when I teach this text, yeah, I, I like that translation to serve and to guard. Uh, I I often go to Joshua. I'm forgetting which chapter it is now, but it's uh, the one you know. Uh, Choose this day whom you shall serve, uh, whether the you know gods of the Amorites or uh, the true God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So it's the same word to serve the Lord, avad to avad the Lord, to avad the land. Uh, there in two um, two fifteen, uh, translated in the NRSV to till it uh, or work it. That's a fine translation, but it does have the connotation of to serve as well and to guard, just as you guard the the Torah, just as just as the Lord keeps um, us in Psalm one twenty one, the Lord. Uh, is your keeper at your right hand, right? Uh, the Lord will keep you from all harm. These are the same verbs used in this verse. So uh, perhaps a, a good um, way of getting into the text. I want to highlight something that um, I think probably gets overlooked um, in this in this story, but that I find really evocative. And that's the, the passage about the river. So in verse 10, a river flows out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divides and becomes four branches. And then it names them, the Pishon, uh, the uh, Gihon, uh, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. Now, everyone knew where the Tigris, everyone knows where the Tigris and the Euphrates are, right? Those are the great rivers of Mesopotamia. Uh, the, the Gihon, the only other body of water or, or water source we know of called the Gihon is that freshwater spring at the base of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And then we don't really know what the Pishon is. I tend to think it's probably the Nile, uh, the Nile River, because you know you have the two great rivers of Mesopotamia. What's the other great river of the ancient Near East? Well, it's the it's the Nile. Uh, but I find it really interesting that the Gihon is mentioned here. It's like in the theological imagination of this writer, this little you know uh, locally important but not very uh, majestic spring in Jerusalem is to be equated with the Tigris and the Euphrates, right? That, that somehow, uh, um, and, and in later tradition, of course, the Garden of Eden is associated with the temple and the temple mount. Uh, a lot of the same symbol symbolism is used uh, for both, uh, particularly in the legal text. So it, it's just this kind of theological imagination of it's, it's from the, the house of God, from the temple itself that life flows, uh, that, that, that God is the source of life and that God's house is the source of life. I just find that really a, a beautiful kind of imagery. <laughs> and of course we see uh, uh, trees uh, uh, a few verses later, 
um, God uh, uh, plants uh, the trees in the garden. You may uh, eat of every tree of the garden. <laughs> and then we know that that doesn't go so well in the next chapter. But you get rivers and trees here at the beginning of the story. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to pause for a second. <coughs> you can cut that out, Ethan. So you get rivers and trees here at the beginning of the story. You get rivers and trees at the end of the story too in Revelation, right? Where you have uh, the river going through uh, the the uh, the the um, the new Jerusalem, and on either side of the river is the tree of life with uh, leaves for the healing of the nations. Uh, so the kind of beginning and the end uh, here, uh, both beautiful imagery about rivers and trees and um, and the source of true life, which is God and God's sanctuary. I appreciate that. And since you brought up that piece, I'm going to pose a question um, because uh, both of you kind of live in the Old Testament. Um, and, and I was made aware of a, um, of the, a focus on the way the text uh, talks about the location of these trees. And uh, in English, it's commas, but I don't know how the Hebrew re reads, but it's in um, verse 9. It says, um, out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food. We know from chapter 1 that there's enough of, of resources from those plants to feed all of humanity and also all of the animals, all the living creatures. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and then after that comma, it says, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, which uh, I was brought to my attention that it basically centers the tree of life. And then comma, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I was told that there's a, some traditions that don't assume that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are actually in the center, that you have all the trees around the, all of creation, all, all of the garden, and then you have in the center the tree of, the knowledge, uh, the tree of life, and then a comma, and also there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I, I found that interesting because in that particular uh, reference, it's, it, it notes, as you've leaned into, Catherine, that what happens in the next chapter is that um, it becomes the center of the imagination of humanity. Hmm. So it's not the center, but it becomes their center. Um, I, found that, I found that an interesting, and I don't know if the Hebrew supports that. Do, do you guys know that off the top of your head? I it's, do not know that uh, off the top of my head, but I like that interpretation. Uh, certainly, if the English is following the Hebrew closely, then you're right that the tree of life is uh, is the center of that, uh, in the center of that, you know, grammatical construction, and perhaps in the garden as well. But mm -hmm. you're right that you know it, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is kind of a, it's not an afterthought. I mean, it's not that unimportant, but it is mentioned last and yet that becomes the center of uh humanity of adam and eve's uh, attention in the next chapter in a way that is not uh helpful or healthy right like they're given what as as you said ralph they're given a vocation and they're given the gift of the whole garden and they're given one prohibition and that's what they obsess about right yeah yeah yeah, they have, they have uh, Sam Wells said they have uh, a playground, the creation. Um, they have a purpose to bear uh, the image of God, to embody in the flesh the goodness of God. And they have one prohibition. Right. And uh, that, that becomes the center. And, and when you read it in those clauses in that way, you have all, all the resources that you need. You have the you have access to life and you have access to knowledge, uh, particularly the knowledge of good and evil and stepping out of relationship with God 
to take that access and and it, it compromises everything. I know I just went to the next chapter, but um, in in your idea of naming, um, if we begin to to take that as a focus, um, it's it it for me it runs into how Jesus names eternal life in the Gospel of John. Uh, the disciples hear Jesus talking to the Creator, whom He calls Father, in John seventeen verse three, and He says, "This is life eternal to know." God. Hmm. And there they have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they have the tree of life. And that would be as in eavesdropping on that prayer, that would be relationship with God. And God is the creator. God has provided all of this. We are created to bear God's image from chapter one. And um, it's, it's interesting to think that what occupies our imagination is always the prohibition. Yeah, I think that probably the tree, because it does say in chapter three, referring to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, that it okay. probably doesn't work literally, but certainly theologically that uh, the, that's what's going on in this story. Okay. Um, I want to point out uh, something about a, a, a verse that is often misunderstood, and that is the, the where it's, uh, it says, uh, I think it's 19. Let me look. I just have been flipping back and forth between my Hebrew. It's verse 18. Um, it is not good that the man shall be alone. I will make for him a, then it's translated helper as a partner. Um, it really should say, the word helper is okay as long as you understand that the word the 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 being called helper most often in the Old Testament is God. So uh -huh. it does not mean uh, any sort of diminutive or you know sort of assistant. Right. And then as his partner, that's pretty good because um, the, the 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 construction there actually then uh, is about mutuality. It yeah. says. Um, uh, let us make, or let me make for him, or I will make for him a helper according to his opposite. Uh, so, um, kind of corresponding really about, to him, or something like that. Yeah, that's a good word. Cor yes. Um, so th then, th then you get this really comic scene where um, looking for a helper, a mutual, uh, an equal, uh, God brings every animal to uh, to the man to see what he will name him with then whatever that name is given, but it's deep hilarious because none of the animals uh, is then found to be uh, satisfactory to, to the yeah. man as a, a, right, a mutual partner. And it's to act this out in children's sermons is a lot of fun, you know, uh, to, uh, to literally act out the story. And then of course, finally then, um, uh, Having said, by the way, it is not good, which is corresponds with Genesis one when everything's good when it is in balance. Uh, it is not good until then. There is this equal, this uh, mutual partner uh, who is uh, the woman, the mother of life. Yeah, thanks. In this, I pre I really appreciate that because in this uh, in in the first uh, creation narrative. Um, what is good is what works, what, what will provide for uh, all of uh, creation. The, the, the fruit of the trees um, uh, will feed all of humanity and, and all of life. And the assignment of humanity uh, in there is to uh, have dominion over all the earth. And um, when you get to chapter two, um, there's not that possibility because it's not good for the human. And I, I teasingly sometimes say the only time in all creation that God said not like this is when God made a man and he went, oh, I can do better than that. But that's not <laughs> good Hebrew. That much I know. That's not a good translation. It's when God created the human alone. And as you said, um, and so uh, through all of the beasts, all of the creatures that, that get me, there is no creature that is a mutual partner, a corresponding partner that will enable the human to do the work 
of having dominion over the earth and flourishing over all the earth uh, until God creates of man, woman. And uh, I like to play with the English word there is Adam wakes up from this sleep and sees what God has created. And he goes, whoa, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Too. Well, there's lots here in this text. Uh, we've touched on a few themes, uh, but obviously uh, we invite you to, to find what speaks most to you and to your congregation as you enter into this new year uh, of, of school and this uh, new program, uh, church program year uh, with the Narrative Lectionary. So uh, may you find joy in the, in the journey. <laughs>